Hey guys, welcome back. Today we're gonna to be talking about chapter seven, um, which goes over the skeleton and skeletal system. Specifically, we'll be talking about major bones in the skeleton. The chapter kind of covers a little bit of everything. Um, it's broken into our um, two separations of our skeleton, the axial and appendicular. We're gonna be starting off with axial, and today I'm gonna to be focusing on just the bones of the skull. Um, I wanna point out in the background, I got my two little weirdos, Echo and Reagan barking and chewing bones in the background, but at least they're being pretty quiet right now. And I am going to make another video. My next upload will be of an actual physical skull, and I'm going to have a pointer, and I will be pointing out the different demarcations, um, articulations, the different bones, suture lines, things, and all of their names. So you can see a three-dimensional version of everything that we're talking about today. Um, as I go through and you see the same pictures pop up again and again and again, I'm only going to spend like a minute talking about the first one, but then when you see that same picture pop back up, there's this thing called the pause button. It looks like two like vertical bars, like a Roman numeral number two, or like two lowercase l's next to each other. Click that and then just look at the picture because if I sit here and wait like Dora the Explorer, waiting for you to, what do we see? We see a frontal bone. Like that's boring. So if you wanna pause it and look at it longer, great. Like I said, I'm also gonna film another video of an actual three-dimensional skull in my hands and a pointer, and I will tell you all the major things you need to know. This chapter does include a lot of vocabulary and it's a little bit scary looking. I'm not gonna be covering all of it specifically for my class and my intents and purposes, but I do have a list here in front of me of the major things that I need you to know from this PowerPoint presentation that I'll be going through and making sure that you hit all of those. Okay, so let's go ahead and get into this. Okay, so we're gonna be talking about the skeleton today. So the skeletal system or the skeleton is composed of bones, cartilage, joints, and ligaments. So cartilage, joints, and ligaments kind of come in the next chapter, chapter eight. We're gonna be focusing on bones because the skeleton is mostly made of bone. And you, you have cartilage here and there in isolated areas where you have bones like grinding on bone. You'll have a cartilage like um, cushion between them and you have ligaments that connect your bones and reinforce your joints, which again has to deal with chapter eight. Um, the skeleton accounts for about 20% of body mass. So think about if someone is like 160 pounds that 20% of that, well, there's an imaginary decimal. Here's your 10%. So 16 times two, what, that's 32. Hello, you can't see that. 32. So 32 pounds of this human is just bone. That's kind of crazy. It's kind of a lot. Okay, um, we have two major divisions of our skeleton that I mentioned earlier that we um, kind of acknowledge here. We have the axial skeleton, which makes up like your trunk. And then the appendicular, because it's to dealing with your appendages. So these are like your arms and your legs. Okay, those are like your appendages. So we're gonna be starting off with the axial skeleton today. So the axial skeleton is um, this section of your body, section of your bones that consists of 80 different bones and it's divided into three major regions. So you have your skull, which is what we're gonna be focusing on today, your vertebral column, which will be the second part of this. And I'm also gonna link that in with the thoracic cavity, okay, or the cage, thoracic cage, which of course refers to your rib cage. Okay, so the axial skeleton has three major functions. It forms the longitudinal, the long up and down lengthwise axis of your body. It supports your head, your neck and your trunk and it is helpful in protecting your brain, your spinal cord, and your thoracic organs. If you think about this, protecting your brain and your thoracic organs, you know, like your lungs and your heart, like that's a huge job that this axial skeleton is gonna be accomplishing for us here. So it's very important, because if you don't have protection for your brain, your lungs, and your heart, you're probably not gonna be alive for very long. So here we have a picture of the human skeleton. Um, you're going to see this a couple of times popping up. So it has two different colors here. It's kind of like a greenish blue. I'm going to call it blue. It's like a teal. Okay, that blue is showing you the skull, the vertebral column, and then, of course, your thoracic cage. That is going to be the axial skeleton, which is what we're focusing on today, specifically the skull for today's lecture. Um, and then the second part here is going to be like this golden yellowy color, and that's going to be your appendicular um, skeleton. And so that's gonna be all your appendages, your limbs and things like that. But we're gonna be focusing on talking about the axial first, which is just this section here. And we're gonna be focusing on the skull today. Okay, here's an, um, a back view, a posterior view of all of this. This one is, of course, from the front, the anterior. Okay, so here we can see the posterior view. Same thing, the same colors are true. 
Okay, so we're talking about the skull, and the skull is a really complicated, like, just section of bone, okay? So the skull is the most complex bony structure in your body. Yay, we get to start off with the hardest part, okay? It's formed by two different sets of bones. It's your cranial bones and your facial bones. So your cranial bones are, they're forming your cranium, okay? They enclose the brain and the cranial cavity, which, of course, you know, houses the brain. Um, it provides a site for attachment for your head and your neck muscles. This is how you're able to actually move, which is important. So secondly, like I mentioned, we have the facial bones. They make up your face. Okay, they're going to form the framework of your face. They're going to contain the cavities for your special sense organs, for sight, taste, and smell. They're going to provide openings for air and food passage. They're going to secure your teeth. They're going to anchor your facial muscles in order to help you uh, maintain your facial expression. Okay, um, and then most of our bone skulls are going to be flat and locked together, except for your mandible, which is your jawbone, the lower jawbone. And that's the one that moves up and down if you put your hand on your chin. That's the one that's moving. Okay, that's going to be your mandible. Um, so that's the one that's kind of like more free. Okay, the other ones are firmly locked together. And these joints are called sutures. They're like serrated. Like it looks like little jagged toothy. It's not the smooth appearance, okay? So it's kind of like this interlocking, and you'll see that as we look at some real pictures in a minute. Okay, so these are the, this is a picture of the skull. These are the bones of the cranium here. And then of course you can see our mandible that we were talking about earlier. So we have the cranium, and then we have more of like our facial bones. And we'll get into all of these and what all of them are. Okay. So we're going to look at the overview of the skull here, the geography of the skull as a whole. So our facial bones form the anterior, the front aspect, with the cranium forming the rest of the skull, so more like superior and posterior. Okay, so the cranium is divided into the vault and the base. Okay, so the cranial vault forms the superior, lateral, and posterior portion of the skull, as well as your forehead, whereas the base is going to form the inferior aspect of the skull. Okay, so the inferior base here is um, it's an internal base that's divided into three different steps or fossa. So fossa are like um, areas that things can attach to. They're called articulations in your textbook. Um, it's essentially somewhere that something's going to anchor to. It's just a point of contact between this part of the bone and something else. So you have the anterior, middle, and posterior fossa that we're gonna look at. And then the brain sits within these fossa so that's what's anchoring here, and it's enclosed by the cranial vault. Okay, so then that whole area is referred to as the cranial cavity, which houses our brain. So here's a picture to show you all the little fossa. So it's actually talking about these like little like bumps and grooves and things that you can see on the bones. They're not just like 100% smooth and all circular and nice and pretty. They have little bumps and grooves and dents and divots and all of those things have a purpose. So these are called fossa in this case. We have the anterior ones, which of course are going to be in the front of your face. This is like the back of your head. This is like your face. Okay, so the anterior cranial fossa are in the front. Then you have your middle, which is somewhere like if your ears were like here, right? That's a really great ear. Look at me go. Okay, and then this is like the back of your head. You have your posterior cranial fossa there. Okay, so here's a side view of your skull, and we just talked about the cranial cavity, and what does that house? It houses your brain. So here's a picture of your brain that's actually inside of the cranial cavity here made by, you know, your skull. Okay, so we just talked about all those different fossa and how we have things attached there. So you have your like your frontal lobe of the um, of the brain here that's going to be sitting in one of these little notches. You have the uh, different cranial fossa that are pointed out to you as like these like little like rounded off edges, right? So those are actual like little points on the bone that um, you have like attachment sites for the brain in this case, and sometimes it's for different ligaments or muscles, right? So in this case, we're talking about the brain being um, tightly secured and tucked into our cranial cavity to prevent it from being like jostled around. It's like a perfect fit and that's a good thing for us. Okay, so we're going to continue our overview here. So the cranium also contains other cavities. Cavities are just like holes, okay? So the middle and internal ear cavities, your nasal cavities, and the orbits, which are like your eye sockets, okay? It holds your eyeball. Um, the skull has 85 named openings. Let me say that again. 85 named openings. This is a lot of openings. We will not be covering all of these. I'm going to point out the major ones I need you to know. Okay, but these openings have different names. They're called foramina or foramen. Hello. Foramen. That's like singular. 
and foramina is like plural. Okay, canals and fissures. These are just the names for these openings. Um, and these openings are going to provide passageways for the spinal cord, the major blood vessels, and also 12 cranial nerves that we have running around in our heads. Okay, so this is a um, view of the major cavities of the skull through a frontal section. So you can see here that this was the section that was created to show you all these cavities. There's a lot of open space happening here. Your cranial cavity, which has your brain, your orbits that have your eyeballs, you have all the different sinuses there, your oral cavity, which of course is your mouth, right? So there's a lot of open space here, but this is still the most complex bony structure in the body. So the cranium itself. Okay, the cranium is um, comprised of eight cranial bones. Now, sometimes um, in some resources that you read, you're going to see an additional one called the ethmoid bone. We're going to talk about that one later, but we're going to talk about the frontal bone, the parietal bones, the left and right side, occipital bone, which is in the back, temporal bones, and sphenoid bones, which are going to be on the left and right side as well. Okay, so this is the front, this is the back, and this is kind of like the things that exist in between. Okay. So the frontal bone is a shell-shaped bone, and it forms the anterior, the front part of the cranium. The vertical part is called the squamous region. Think about it like being like flat, like that's like your forehead, okay? It's also known as your forehead. So the inferior part, the underneath part, is okay, it's gonna be the portion that ends at the supraorbital margins. So the lower part of the frontal bone ends at the supraorbital margins, which is just underneath your eyebrows. That's kind of like if you push underneath your eyebrows, don't do it hard. If you push underneath your eyebrows, you can feel like that your bone ends. Like ladies, that's like where your highlight would go under your eyebrows to make them look snatched, right? Okay, that's, that's where it's talking about that margin there. That's the lower margin of your frontal bone. Okay, so this is going to form the superior wall of the orbits and most of the anterior cranial fossa. Okay, um, our supraorbital foramen are little notches that are going to allow the supraorbital artery and nerves to pass through to the forehead. And then you have you have your uh, glabella, which is the area the area of the frontal bone between your eyes, between the orbits, the little sockets where your eyeballs are going to go. Okay, so then you have your frontal sinuses that are located near that area around the glabella. So let's look at some images. Okay, this one I took the time to like color code things for you and be like, oh look, these are the things that we just talked about. Yep, I just said all of this. I color coded this one, but this same picture, like the textbook company literally copy and pasted about a billion times in this presentation. I'm gonna leave it up here to talk about right now, but then at the other ones, what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to hit those two vertical lines, looks like a Roman numeral two, pause button. That's so you can stop and look and be like, oh, okay, this time we just talked about this other word. And I'm not going to have them color coded anywhere else, just right here, because it takes a lot of time and I'm short on time. Just trying to help you out though. Okay, so your frontal bone is what we just talked about here. It's yellow. Okay, we talked about your glabella, which is the area between your orbits or your eye sockets. We talked about the supraorbital foramen, the supraorbital margin, which is the end of your um, frontal bone here. Like I said, that's right below your eyebrows. Um, and then we talked about the squamous or the flat part of your frontal bone. So these are the things that we just talked about. So I color coded them for you, but you see all these other things. We didn't talk about that. I mean, we talked about mandible, but earlier, right? The rest of this we haven't talked about yet. So don't look at this picture and be like, oh my God, that's a lot of words. You're right, it is a lot of words. But if you just chunk it like one section at a time, like this little yellow part, great, we got that frontal bone, done, moving on. Don't overwhelm yourself unnecessarily. Oh, look, this is that ethmoid bone that I was telling you about. Sometimes they group that into like the eight bones that make up the cranium. So they call it nine. It just depends on the book that you're reading. For me, it's eight bones and ethmoid bone is not included in that. Here's another view. Um, I again labeled here your frontal bone. It's the yellow one. Okay, so this is looking from like from the bottom up. So a superior view. I'm sorry, from, from the top down. It's a superior view of the skull. This is the same picture as this. This one is color coded and nice and labeled and pretty. This one is what a skull actually looks like. So you can see all of these little foramen, all the little holes here. They're not as nicely arranged, right? They're, they're not perfectly equal on either side because your face is not built perfectly equal on all sides. It's just not, okay? So this is a realistic view. This is a nice textbook color. Ooh, look at the pretty images view. Okay, it's the same picture though. Okay, cool. 
So we're going to talk, we talked frontal bone. So for the frontal bone, I want you to know about like the, um, the frontal sinuses. And that's about it for that one um, that you can see in the, did I show you a, I'll point it out in the next time that they have a sagittal view. Okay. That's all I wanted you to really know about for the frontal. Okay. Um, we're going to go into the parietal bones and the major structures present with the parietal bones. So you have two large parietal bones that form the most, most of the superior and lateral aspects of the cranial vault. So like the top and kind of like the upper sides of your head. Um, so you have four suture marks um, and articulations of the parietal bones with the frontal, occipital, and temporal bones. So you have these sutures, which remember are those like little like jagged serrated little lines that are that exist where two bones come together. So the coronal suture is between the parietal bones and the frontal bone. Well, we just talked about this one. We're talking about these right now. So the coronal suture is this little jagged line that exists between these bones that we're talking about. Then you have the sagittal suture, which is the right and left. It's between the parietal bones because I'm telling you that there's a left and right one that makes up like the top and the upper side portions of your skull. And in between them is a sagittal suture. Okay, so you have like a right side and you have a left side. Okay, and then the coronal would be like, this would be your front and this would be your back posterior. Okay, you have your um, lambdoidal suture or lambdoid suture, which is between the parietal bones and the occipital. Occipital is in the back and I can't add it to my beautiful diagram here because it's not at the right angle. And then you have your squamous or squamos squamosal sutures that are between the parietal and temporal bones on each side of the skull. Okay, so yes, you need to know these and I'll point them out as we get more pictures to show you. And like I said, the whole next video is gonna be me with the skull pointing to things you need to know. So you will actually see it. Okay. Okay, so here you can see the suture lines that we were just talking about. So you have the coronal suture, which goes this way. It separates your frontal bone from your parietal bone. You also have your squamous or squamosal. Okay, that is a suture line that's separating the parietal. You have your um, temporal here and your sphenoid here. Okay, you have your um, lambdoid suture here, which is gonna be separating your occipital and your parietal. And um, these are some of the suture lines that we just kind of talked about here, just so you can get an idea. Like I said, I'll have a whole nother video where I point them on an actual skull. Okay, this is another view. Like I said, they added a whole bunch of pictures of extra views. This is your sagittal suture because you can't see that in this picture here because you're only seeing from the side profile. This is showing you that the sagittal is the one that is gonna be separating your parietal bone, which is here and here. You have two different parietal bones. And then your occipital is the one on the back of your head. You kind of have that like point on the back of your head. That's where your occipital bone is, this whole se section here. It's actually a really, really large bone. Okay, um, and then your lambdoid suture is the one that's dividing here and that's labeled right here. Okay, cool. Um, I did color code this one as well. Look at me go. Okay. So we just talked about the coronal suture. The parietal bone is this like kind of like reddish pinkish, whatever. It's the large one here. You have your squamous suture, lambdoid suture. Those are the ones that we just talked about, pointed out here and color coded. Notice we didn't talk about the rest of it yet. So don't look at the rest of the picture and overwhelm yourself. Look at what we just talked about and make sure that you can identify those things. Um, okay, so yes, with the parietal, I just needed you to know the sagittal suture and the coronal suture, really important structures. These are just more bones, more pictures of bones showing you exactly the same thing. Um, the colors are exactly the same. Like I said, they have more realistic. This is a real skull. Okay, and then this is, of course, our nice like textbook version that's all color coded and pretty. Okay, so I'm like I said, I'm not going to spend a lot of time explaining each of these pictures. Click on that what? The pause button and I explain to you what it looks like. Beautiful. Okay, same picture again. So let's talk about the occipital bone. That's that brown one that we just talked about. And I said it's actually like deceivingly huge. Okay, so it forms most of the skull's posterior wall and the posterior cranial fossa. So like the back side of the head, it's forming that area. It's going to articulate and like meet up with, interact with um, the parietal, temporal, and sphenoid bones. Um, you have something called the foramen magnum, which is a very large hole through which the brain connects to the spinal cord. So when you look down through the top of your skull, there's a fat hole in the middle. That's what it is. It's the foramen magnum, which literally means large hole. Okay, that's going to be where your spinal cord comes up to meet your brain. 
Um, it's going to be flanked by a pair of occipital um, condyles that are going to articulate with the first vertebra, which we'll talk about later. That's all important to help you move. Okay. Um, and it also, you know, has to do with your, um, your vision and all of that, where everything's kind of running together, because of course you have these nerves that are running through your skull and your spine and it's great. Okay. Um, so then we have our hypoglossal, um, canal that allows the cranial nerve, um, 12 to pass through. So that's what I was just talking about there. Beautiful. Um, let me see. On my little, I'm checking and double checking my list. Your occipital bone, I want you to know that it is huge. It's a lot bigger than the other ones because it contains the um, the inferior part of the skull as well. Um, I want you to know about the lamboidal suture. I want you to know about the foramen magnum, which we talked about, the occipital uh, condyles that are allowing your head to move essentially. Okay. And then, of course, you have a bunch of nerves that are going to be going through here as well. Okay. So then our external occipital protuberance is a protrusion just superior to the foramen magnum. So just above that, okay? You have the external occipital crest, which are ridges that are on the side of the attachment for the uh, ligamentum nucae, and then superior and inferior um, nuchal lines, which are the site of attachment for many neck and back muscles. Okay, so these are all other things that are associated with your occipital um, bone, but like I said, I really wanted you to focus on the lamboidal structure, suture, the foramen magnum, um, the occipital condyles, and like what all of these things do, where they're located, things like that. Okay, so um, we just kind of talked about this. This was our bone that we're discussing, the occipital. Okay, the condyles are right here. They're these little like nubs that's going to interact with your um, vertebral column in order to allow your head to move. Okay, um, and like I said, you have a bunch of nerves that are going to be passing up blood vessels, your spinal cord, your, you know, everything's passing up through your um, frame and magnum, which means large hole. Okay, so those are kind of the things that we're talking about. We talked about the lamboid suture. We talked about the sagittal suture, how they kind of make this like upside down Y shape. And that is where your occipital bone sits. Here's another picture. So look at all this brown here. This is what I was talking about. It's like deceivingly huge. All of this is occipital bone. And this giant hole that I was referring to, yeah, that's your foramen magnum. Okay, that is going to be where your head meets your spine. Okay, that's important. It's a very large hole because you got a lot of things running through there. Okay, so this is what I was talking about earlier. Like I said, don't look at the rest of all of these words because there's a lot of them. We're focusing on certain things here called our occipital bone. Okay, same picture, realistic. What are you supposed to do? Pause it if you want to. Okay, we're going to talk about the temporal bones. There's two of them. You got a left and right. Okay, these are paired bones that make up the um, inferior lateral aspects. So inferior below, lateral to the outsides, left and right, aspects of the skull and parts of the cranial base. So we have three major zones that we're going to be talking about. You have the squamous region, which is the zygomatic process, articulate with the zygomatic bone to form the zygomatic arch, and the mandibular fossa makes up the part of the... Um, our mandibular joint. Okay, this is a lot of words, okay? Zygomatic is basically referring to the section. It kind of creates, so I'm trying to like point on my face and you can't see that, so that's not helpful for you. So it's between like the top of your ear and like your nose, like your cheekbone, right? It's that bone that kind of goes, it's divided into two different sections, but your zygomatic process is kind of like along that area. Okay, it's all associated with the temporal bone, zygomatic process. It's going to articulate with the zygomatic bone, which is more like your cheekbones, okay, um, to form your zygomatic arch. That's like the arch of, you know, your cheekbones. Like some people have really pronounced ones and some people don't. And some people are just you know, naturally gifted and don't have to contour their whole face. Okay, your mandibular fossa is where your uh, jaw is meeting up with your temporal bone, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, the second of these major regions is going to be the um, the tympanic uh, panic region, which is surround it surrounds the external acoustic uh, meatus, which is going to be your ear canal on the outside. You also have an internal one as well. Um, and then the third part is going to be the petrus. That's the third major region that is uh, making up your temporal bone here. So the petrus region is going to house the middle and internal ear cavities. So it's going to make up part of the middle cranial fossa. 
Okay, so we have sev um, several different foramina that penetrate the petrous region. So remember that foramina is just like, um, we're, we're talking, this is multiple foramen, okay? So these are like passageways. These are like little um, cavities, little holes, essentially. You have your jugular foramen that allows passage of three cranial nerves, your um, carotid canal, which is a passageway for your internal um, carotid artery. You have your foramen lacerum, which is a jagged opening covered by the cartilage in living human. Um, and then you have um, your internal acoustic meatus. You have the um, styloid and mastoid foramen, which are the cranial nerve, nerve passageways. And these mastoid and styloid processes that are areas for attachment of a lot of different uh, like neck and tongue muscles, allowing your neck to move and allowing you to speak properly. Now, like I said, a lot of these things are all details about our um, temporal bone here, okay? But with the temporal bone, I need you to focus on the suture. Remember the uh, squamosal suture that's gonna run right on top of that. We'll look at the picture. I need you to focus on the mandibular fossa, which again, that's where your, it's a little crevice where your jaw actually connects to your skull. Um, your external auditory meatus um, or acoustic meatus, um, you have your zygomatic process, which I just explained, and then your internal auditory meatus or um, acoustic meatus. So I'm going to point those out to you in some pictures and then also again in my next video as well. Um, so yeah, those are the things I want you to focus on for the temporal bones. So let's look at that. So we just talked about temporal bones. Temporal bone is going to be this orange area here, okay? So this little like notch right here is your mandibular fossa. It's like a little notch that is where your mandible attaches. Okay, so I want you to know that. This little hole here, it's a hole. It's your external acoustic meatus or auditory meatus because it's like, you know, your ear hole. You also have one on the inside of your um, skull, which I'll show you in my other video. I'm going to make an internal view of that. It is just called the internal auditory or acoustic meatus. Real life bones. Okay, and then this is just some more, oh, this is talking about the zygomatic process here. So like I said, this, it's not cut here. It's just showing you a portion. It actually continues. So like this is the region we're looking at. And then this is the region that starts to make, you know, like your cheekbones. Okay, and then that continues down. Okay, so the zygomatic process is going to be the area, the first area that I drew here. Okay, it's not broken off. It's just showing you it's just this part. It's called the zygomatic process. So that's the area I want you to be able to identify as well. So it's kind of like up at the top of your ear. And like I said, it kind of connects down to like the middle of your nose, kind of. That's where that's the area that we're talking about. But we're talking about just the upper part in the temporal bone that makes up the zygomatic process. Here's your view from um, the inferior side looking up with the mandible re removed. So we just talked about this here. So we're looking at this section here, okay? Again, if you wanna look at these pictures, I'm gonna let you pause them. Okay, then the next thing we're gonna talk about is our two sphenoid bones. So your sphenoid bones are complex. They say bat-shaped. I like to say butterfly-shaped because that sounds more pleasant to think that there's a butterfly in my face rather than a bat. Okay, so I like to say butterfly-shaped bone. So it's a keystone bone that articulates with all other cranial bones. I mean, that's kind of important, right? It's going to interact with a lot of our other bones. Um, so our sphenoidal sinuses are found within the body of the sphenoid. Makes sense because it's located in that bone. Like our frontal sinus is located where? In our frontal bone. Makes sense. Okay, so the body also includes the um, cella turcica, which is a, it's a, little notch that we're going to look at when I do my actual video of the, the full on skull. Um, and it's a little prominence that's going to include the um, hypophysial fossa, which is going to hold your pituitary gland. So like the cella, the cella tersica holds your pituitary gland, which is a part of your brain. So the sphenoid con um, contains three pairs of processes greater wings, lesser wings, and um, pterygoid wing uh, processes. 
here. So yeah, we'll look at a picture. It is literally like you have like these like larger wing regions and these little smaller wings. And then there's like the central part. It kind of looks like a scary happy face. Look at me go. Okay. It's kind of literally what it looks like. So we'll look at a picture in a minute. Um, this phenoid contains several different foramina. Remember that this is just plural holes. Okay. Canals are a word for holes. Fissure is a word for holes. Okay. So you have your optic canals, which are allowing passageway for your optic nerves. You have the superior orbital fissure, which allows our cranial nerve passage. Uh, we have the foramen rotundum and foramen um, ovulae, which um, is another passage for our cranial nerves. Foramen spinosum, which is opening for arteries. I'm just going to say for my kiddos, I'm not going to ask you about these things. Just understand that it has a lot of holes in it. Why? These a fancy word for holes. Okay, why? Because it's interacting with all of the other bones. So obviously if it's interacting with all the other bones, you're going to have some sort of like passageways existing between them for nerves and blood. That's important because it's your brain. It needs a good nerve supply and it needs a good blood supply. Okay, so I'm gonna want you to know this here that it contains lots of them. I'm not gonna ask you what each one of these does. Okay, that's for my kids specifically. So here's some images of what we just talked about. Look, it looks like a butterfly. Look at the little antenna and everything, okay? It's so beautiful. All right, so this is where it is located in your head. It's the sphenoid bone. Here it is, it's in the middle. Okay, so you have all of the different little things that we just talked about, the greater wings, you have the lesser wings. Um, you have your superior orbital fissure that we just talked about. They're actual physical little tiny holes. It's kind of interesting. Okay, um, so these are all the things, the cella tersica that we just talked about. So this is what I was talking about. It's kind of like a little eyeball, a little eyeball. Actually, I lied to you. Hold on. Think about, oops, think about the eyes being like here, here, and then this is like the happy face. Okay, so like the tella tersica right here, that's going to hold your pituitary gland, which is a very important gland, which we're going to get to in about two or three units. Okay, it's part of your brain. Awesome. Okay, so this is a little image for you just to kind of go over everything that we just talked about. And again, this will be in my next video as well. I'll point out everything to you on an actual skull. Okay, so next we have our um, ethmoid bone. It's going to be the deepest skull bone. It's like inside your face. Okay, um, the superior part is formed by the um, paired uh, cribriform plates that also form the roof of the nasal cavity, so like the roof of your nose, and then the floor of the anterior cranial fossa. You have something called the crista galli that are little triangular pieces, little triangular processes um, that point out the attachment for the brain's dura mater covering. Um, you have the perpendicular plate, which runs, you know, perpendicular. It forms the superior part of the nasal septum. So the septum is a little thing that separates your two nostrils. So it's starting to make up that bone there. Um, and it's flanked by the lateral masses that contain sinuses called the ethmoidal air cells. Okay, the lateral masses are um, going to extend to the... Um, the medially, so towards the center, uh, to form the superior and middle uh, nasal concha, which means shell. It's just like these like little, it shows you like, you got your middle and then you got like, I can't draw. There are these like little bumps. I'm gonna point it out to you on a real skull. If this is like your, your nose, like the hole that would make your nose, like thinking about like Voldemort, right? Okay, there's like these little tiny bumps on the sides. That's what the concha are referring to. I'm hoping that there's a picture of it in a minute. Okay, so then we have our orbital plates that are gonna to contribute to the medial wall of the orbits, which of course the orbits are the sockets that holds your eyeballs. Okay, so we just talked about the crystal galley right here. We talked about the cribriform plates and how they're on the sides of the crystal galley. Okay, we've got them here and here. Okay, um, you have your orbital plate, you have your air cells, the perpendicular plate, which, you know, it's running perpendicular to the passageways here, okay? Um, so that's kind of what we were just kind of talking about. And the concha that I was talking about earlier, you'll see them kind of like on the sides, like here in the nasal cavity. Okay. So here's another image of that. So these are the things that we just talked about. So like I said, if you wanna look at it, stop and pause. This is the uh, superior view going down. Okay, we're talking about the ethmoid bone here. So we're talking, it's a triangle shaped bone. That would be a good fun fact for you to know about it. 
Okay, um, we're going to go to the sutural bones. So these are tiny, irregularly shaped bones that appear within the sutures. Remember that the sutures are those like little jagged lines where all of the different plates of your skull meet. Okay, the significance of these little tiny bones is not really known. Um, not everyone has them. It could just be because of the way that your skull grew together because you know that during development, babies have those little things called quote soft spots. Okay. Um, that's just where your uh, bones haven't grown together completely because think about it, if you had a full blown skull trying to come out of your mom with no wiggle room, it's going to be even worse than it already is. Okay. So you have a little bit of cartilage that exists between those bones to make your head slightly more flexible for lack of a better term. Um, that's why some babies are like born with like cone heads because their head was kind of like squished, but like it'll go back, right? But these soft spots are like the little areas of cartilage like between the bones and then your sutures develop over time. So these little tiny irregular suture bones um, could just be because of the way that your head formed, the speed at which it formed, we're not really sure the significance of them and not everyone has them. So the little suture bones, here's some examples here and here. So not everyone has them. Um, they just kind of appear not really sure the purpose of them, if there is any. Okay, our facial bones. This is the second type of bone that makes up your skull. Okay, you have 14 bones in all. 12 of them are paired. Your mandible and your vomer are single bones, so they do not have a partner. Okay, so think about like having like a left and right, because your face has a left side and a right side. You have like a left nostril and a right nostril. You have a left eyeball and a right eyeball, okay? Um, so you have pairings, but the mandible and the vomer are the two that do not have a pair. So again, that's something that I would focus in on. Um, so we're going to go through and point out the mandible, maxillary bones, the zygomatic bones, which we talked about a little bit, your cheekbones, nasal bones, makes sense, it's in your nose. Um, you have your uh, lacrimal bones, your palatine bones that are going to make up like the hard palate of your mouth, um, and then the inferior nasal concha. Okay, so your mandible. Your mandible is your jawbone. Okay, it's the largest, strongest bone of your face. Kind of cool. Okay, it's a U-shaped lower jawbone that is made up of a body, which is the chin, and the two upper right um, rame, rami. Okay, they're the parts that go up, like the vertical parts. Okay, um, so you have your mandibular angle, which is the point where the um, rami and the chin meets. You have your coronoid process, which is the superior end of the rami that serve as an um, insertion point for the large temporalis muscles. You have your condylar process, which is going to be posterior to the um, coronoid that's going to form part of the um, temporal mandibular joint, which joints are going to be chapter eight. Okay, um, your mandibular notch is going to separate the processes the body of your mandible consists, consists of um, alveolar process that contains sockets for the teeth. This is where we're going to be actually anchoring our teeth and um, our mandibular um, symphysis ridge. You have foramina that are going to include the mandibular and um, mental foramina. So these are, again, holes that allow passage of nerves and blood vessels. So again, with all of this, these are a lot of like lovely details. I really need you to know that the mandible is a large, strong U-shaped bone that is your jaw bone, okay? That it has these vertical regions that are going to connect to your temporal or your mandibular fossa exists. You're going to have these little condylar processes um, and that's going to be where they meet up with the fossa to actually attach your jaw to your head. So here we go, picture of all of that. So it's showing your mandible here. So remember that this little notch on your temporal bone up there, that's going to be the mandibular fossa, okay? Right here is your um, condylar process. That is actually going to sit inside of that mandibular notch that's part of your, um, your temporal bone in your skull, okay? The mandibular notch dips down here. Okay, um, you have your teeth being anchored. You have the mental foramen, which is going to be a little tiny hole. Okay, this is the mandibular angle. This is different on different people, which gives you like a really strong jawbone or a weaker one. Okay, but these are the things that we just talked about. And I pointed out some of the important things for you here. 
Same picture that we have grown to love. We're going to be focusing on the mandible here. I'm going to let you pause and look at that. Okay, you have your maxillary bones. That's making up like the middle part of your face. So these are um, medially fused to the upper, to form the upper jaw and the central facial skeleton. So we talked about your your mandible, your lower jawbone. We talked about your skull, like the top, the superior, like rounded dome part of your head. Okay, we're talking about like the central area of your face, the maxillary bones. Okay, so um, this is going to help to and contain your upper teeth that are held in alveolar processes, the anterior sinal, um, I'm sorry, the anterior nasal spine that's going to form just below the nose. You have your palatine process that forms two thirds of the hard palate. The hard palate is that bumpy thing on the top of your mouth. Um, and then you have the frontal process. It's going to form the lateral bridge of the nose. You have your zygomatic processes. Um, that are going to articulate with the zygomatic bones. We talked about this as being your cheekbones. Okay, and then you have your maxillary sinuses that are going to flank the, the nasal cavity laterally. So on either side, right, laterally is out. Okay, um, in facial bones, we have openings for nerves and blood vessels. So like I said, this is a commonality here. Like anytime that you have, you know, a major organ, you know, the brain, being held in or near any of these bones, the cranial cavity, right? Um, you're going to have a lot of these um, foramina, these little holes, these little openings that are going to allow nerves and blood to go in and out. That's very important, okay? So that's the thing that I'm focusing on here, the big idea, because otherwise you're gonna get really bogged down by all these little tiny names and all these little tiny details and the pronunciation is different in every video you've ever heard in your life. Okay, but these openings for the nerve and blood vessels are going to include inferior orbital fissures, again, fancy word for hole, um, infraorbital for ramen, another word for hole, and then our um, incisive fossa and canal, which another word for hole. So these are all little openings, and the point of all of these is to allow blood flow and nerve contact, so the nerves go through these areas. Okay, um, so we just kind of talked about the maxilla or our maxillary bones, which make up, like I said, the central part of your face. We talked about our cranial bones. We talked about our mandible, but this is like what makes up the central part of your face. Um, of course, the orbital surface is going to be, you know, like leading up to where your um, orbits are. You have articulations with the frontal bone here. Frontal bone is going to come down and make up, you know, like your forehead. Um, you have a frontal process. Again, processes are just talking about like little bumps and grooves and things on your bones. Um, and all of that, or zygomatic process. This is gonna be like a little cross section. Of course, this will like go up and connect to your cheekbone. That's what it's showing you like here, okay? Um, so we just talked about all of these things. And of course, our upper teeth are located here, whereas our lower set of teeth is located within the mandible. Same picture that we have grown to love, okay? But we're talking about this purple region now. Same thing here. Um, we talked about the um, the palatine process, okay? So that's making up like most of your hard palate, okay? So our zygomatic bones, like I said, this is going to be your cheekbones, okay? Um, so your zygomatic bones form your cheekbones. This is the margin. It's basically separating your eyes from the rest of your face. Okay, so your cheekbones are separating your eyes from the rest of your face. It's a it's a margin there. And they articulate with the zygomatic processes of the temporal, the frontal, and the maxillary bones. So remember that the temporal bone is where the zygomatic processes actually occur. It's like right by it. If you like look at the side profile, that's a weird looking ear, but we're gonna pretend that that's an ear with your little ear hole, okay? From like the top of your ear to like, if here's like the side of your nose, let's say you have a rather unfortunate nose, right? Okay, um, you have kind of like this, this bone that kind of like sweeps down, okay? The part that's up here is gonna be called the process and the rest of it is actually called the zygomatic bone. I'm so good at drawing. Our picture that we have known and grown to love. Okay, next in our facial bones, we have these nasal bones that are gonna form, you know, your nose, cause they're nasal bones. They're gonna form the bridge of your nose. They're going to articulate with the frontal, maxillary, and um, ethmoid bones. They're going to attach to the cartilage to form the tip of your nose because it is largely cartilage and that's why it's wiggly, okay? You have your uh, 
lacrimal bones that are going to form the medial walls of your orbits, which are your, you know, holes where your eyeballs go. It's your eye sockets. They're going to articulate, meet up with, associate with the frontal maxillary and ethmoid bones as well. Notice some similarities here. And the lacrimal um, fossa that houses the lacrimal sac allows the passageway of tears to drain. And after all these words, this might be something that you're experiencing, okay? Because your lacrimal fossa is holding your tear ducts and all of that. You're welcome. Our picture that we have grown to love, our side view here, like I said, if you'd like to pause this, it looks like a Roman numeral too. Okay, our palatine bones that we talked about, these make up like the hard palate of your mouth. So we have two L-shaped bones. Um, I think that they kind of look more like, like this shape, whatever that shape is, whatever. Okay, two L-shaped bones made up by two bony plates. There's a horizontal plate that completes the posterior one third of the hard palate. You have the perpendicular plate that's going to form part of the, um, <clears throat> the posterior lateral, the posterior, posterior lateral walls, the nasal cavity, and the small part of the orbits. Okay, so remember the orbits are your eye sockets. The next thing, remember that the vomer was special because the vomer and the mandible, A-L-E, I-L-E, I'm really bad at spelling. Anyway, um, these two bones were special because they did not have a partner dealing with facial bones. There's 14 bones, 12 of them have partners, and these are the one, two that do not. Okay, the vomer is a plow-shaped bone. It's pretty small, it forms part of the nasal septum. So if you've heard of like a deviated septum, it means that it's like not straight. Okay, the septum is the part that goes between your nostrils. It's like the bone that separates your boogers from one side to the other side of your nose. Okay, so you can actually see that little blue guy right here. This is your vomer. Remember that he's special because he does not have a partner in your facial bones, um, but it's going to start to separate your nasal septum there. Okay, so this gets into the, um, the bones of the nasal cavity. We are not going to cover this in my class, but do pay attention here that you have your um, ethmoid bone that we talked about earlier, that it's kind of in the middle of your skull, like literally like the, the deep middle part of your skull, okay? Um, but here you can see all of our different players that are um, interacting in order to form the nasal cavity. You have the different sinuses that are all labeled here and all of that. Okay, so take a minute to like look over this. These are a lot of things that we've talked about. Okay, just kind of review this. This is a different view dealing with the same bones. Remember that we pointed out some things here that were rather important that you needed to know. Okay. Um, then you have your inferior nasal concha, which like, remember, concha shells. So these are little paired bones that are going to form part of the lateral, the side-to-side -side walls of the nasal cavity. Um, the largest of three pairs of the concha is going to be the ethmoid bone. It's going to be formed the other two. So this here is going to be our largest pair. And then our last pair is going to be from our ethmoid bone here. Like I said, this is not something that I'm focusing on personally. I will, in my next video, point out the concha that I would like you to know from the um, interior of the nasal passage. Same picture here. I'm going to let you just stop and look at these. Okay, um, you have something called the hyoid bone. Um, it's not a bone of the skull itself, but it is really important to the structure of the skull and the functionality of it. It lies um, in the anterior neck inferior to the mandible. Okay, so it's below the mandible and it's in the front part of your neck. Okay, it's the only bone in the body that does not articulate directly with another bone. So it's almost like a free floating bone. It is anchored by ligaments, but it doesn't actually touch any other bone. Um, articulate just means to interact with, it means to touch, it means to be next to, okay? It's actually not next to any other bone, it is just anchored down by uh, ligaments. So it acts as a movable base for your tongue. So your tongue is, you know, it, can, it has muscles, right? So that's going to be like an anchor site um, to allow the attachment for the muscles for swallowing and speech. So it's actually pretty cool that we have this like small little like quote free floating it's not because ligaments are attaching it, but it's kind of cool that it's the only bone that doesn't touch anything else. And it allows us to speak and swallow correctly because it's helping to anchor all of our muscles. Here's a picture of it here. Um, you have like the lesser horn and the greater horn. Okay, these are like attachment sites for the uh, ligaments that are gonna help attach it in place. So it's not just like a random bone floating around in your body. Okay. 
Next, we're going to talk about the orbits and a little bit about the nasal cavity again. So the orbits are um, cavities that encase the eyes and the lacrimal glands. Like I said, those are going to have your tear ducts and everything in them, which are you're probably exercising right now after looking at all these words in this lecture, and I apologize. Okay, um, the orbits are also the site of attachment for eye muscles, which allows you to, you know, move your eyes. And it's going to be formed by parts of seven bones, the frontal, sphenoid, zygomatic, maxilla, palatine, lacrimal, and ethmoid. So this is something that like you should know for me, for my class. So this is a picture here of the right orbit. So you can see that you have these um, for Raymond here that are going to allow the flow of what? Nerve and blood. If we're talking about a hole, what is the hole there for? Nerves and blood, okay? Um, so that's your eye socket. That is the bone that form the orbit. This is just a closer view so you can see those seven different bones that we just kind of talked about. Everything is color coded here for you so you can see that. Again, I'll let you pause and look. Okay, the nasal cavity, like I said, we're just gonna touch on that one more time and then we are out of here for the skull. So the nasal cavity is formed by parts of several bones. You have the roof, which is the cribriform plate of the ethmoid. You have the lateral walls, which are superior and the middle concha of the ethmoid, perpendicular plates of the palatine, and the inferior nasal concha. Okay, don't focus on this for me personally. Um, you also have, so I mean, the nasal cavity is composed of a roof, the lateral walls, the floor, and then you have the septum, which is between your two nostrils. Those would be good things for my kids to focus on here. Okay, there's just too much in this chapter, like for it to be realistic, for all of it to be on one test. Okay, so that's what we're gonna be focusing on here. Again, same picture, stop, look at it, talk about the things I just pointed out. Same picture as before. You also have something called your paranasal sinuses that are gonna be formed from five skull bones, the frontal, sphenoid, ethmoid, and paired maxillary bones. Um, all of, they all contain mucosa-lined air-filled spaces. Now they function in warming up and humidifying your air, which is why it's considered, quote, healthier to breathe through your nose than it is through your mouth. Also, your air is getting filtered by all of the hair that exists in your nose. It's there for a reason to help filter all of that air. But as you're breathing in through your nose, it's uh, the air is getting warmed and humidified, which is just easier for your body to take on. Um, and then it's going to help to lighten the skull because these are sinuses, they're holes, they're cavities. They're literally air pockets that exist in your head to make your head lighter. Okay, and then it's going to um, enhance the resonance of voice. Think about open spaces and echoing and all of that. So here's a picture of our anterior aspect here. Um, you have your frontal sinuses. You might get like sinus headaches if you have like a sinus infection and you have like pressure above your eyes. Um, the maxillary sinuses here are really common for like when you have like facial pressure. Um, due to a sinus infection or something. I've had a sinus infection so bad in my maxillary sinuses that it actually made my teeth loose because it's pressing on that hard palate on the, up of the upper part of my mouth. Um, kind of crazy how that's all connected there. But I mean, your face is a really complicated structure, right? Your skull itself is the most complicated bony structure in our body. We have a side view here. The um, ethmoidal air cells are actually kind of hard to see in a skull because the bones are so thin that typically like if you cut the skull to look at it and it's like an actual human skull, um, they'll just shatter because the bones are so thin. Um, but in like a model, you can see that they're all color coded and nice, right? But these are our ethmoidal air cells. You have our um, frontal sinuses that I showed you earlier. You have your sphenoidal sinuses here and your maxillary sinuses. Okay, so this is going to be the end of part one. Okay, part one covered our cranial bones and the important structures. Okay, um, the next section is going to be covering vertebral bones and associated structures there. And I'm also probably going to throw in the thoracic cage in with that one. Um, and you'll notice at the end of this that I cut out the development, um, the development of your skeleton just for time's sake, because this chapter is like 60 something textbook pages long, like it's huge. And the detail is kind of exhaustive. So I just want to kind of like condense that down for you guys a little bit. Thank you for sticking with me. Um, I'm really sorry that this was so long. I just wanted to get you as much information as possible. In my next video, I will have a skull with me and I will have a little pointer to point out the things that I need you to know specifically for me, for my class. Like I said, I have a list in front of me that came from 
things you need to know for labels on the exam, questions on the exam. Okay, that way I will point all of that out to you so you have that, you have a video of here's an actual three-dimensional skull that you will actually see in my classroom that you will need to identify structures on. Okay, great. Have a great day. Thanks for sticking with me.